welcome to the first ever episode of the USA Rugby Clubhouse, brought to you by the rugbyshop.com for all your American rugby apparel needs. I'm your host, Ben Foden, and as always, I'll be joined by Mr. America himself, Mr. Mike Petrie. Mike, how are you now you've got into retirement? How have you been enjoying your weekends? What's up, folks? How you doing? It's, it's kind of nice to go into work on a Monday morning like a normal human being, instead of coming in off a red eye flight from San Diego or Vegas or wherever out on the West Coast. It's, uh, it's you know, I never thought a Monday morning workday would be so much looked forward to as it is now. <laughs> so, Mike, how do you feel about being part of the clubhouse moving forward? Obviously, we're going to take an in depth look of all things American rugby. We're going to have MLR players, young and up and coming players. We're going to hopefully have a few NFL players as well. We're always talking about those crossover athletes that we're trying to entice away from the NFL or basketball and come and play play this sport that we love, um, rugby. And hopefully we'll see, we'll, we'll get their opinions on what it's going to take to really make rugby take off in America, make make rugby an American sport. And it's also about sort of finding the next Cam Dolan, the next Mike Petrie. You know, those guys are going to get 50 caps for their country, be the stalwarts for, for American rugby and make some American idols that people can really get behind, whether they're you know, supporting their local team or whether they're supporting America itself when they compete in World Cups and in Six Nations competitions. I think that's what's exciting about this show. We're going to highlight that with some of our guests uh, and really learn their background of what's driven them to sort of make rugby their number one sport. Because like we mentioned, there's so many sports here in America that, 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 that you all love and you sort of cherish in terms of the, the NFL and, and those sports. But um, I think rugby has its place out here and I'm really excited to see where it's going to go and where it's going to develop. Um, and looking forward to, to hopefully going on that joint journey with you and taking taking a few followers and a few listeners with us. Oh, this is going to be exceptional. Although I, I I thought this was like a singing and dancing show. I was really looking forward to learning like the X Factor moves that you you know. I was figured I'm I'm working with Ben Foden. I'm going to learn some like the inside scoop on what goes on on the X Factor. But I, look, if we got to talk rugby, we can talk rugby too. I mean, look, it, it's it's going to be an awesome year. I'm I'm definitely really excited about it. I mean, if the first weekend is any indication of what to expect. Over the course of the next several months, uh, I mean, I mean, what a spectacle! What a show! It's uh, there's a lot in store, and and you know, the eyes of the world are on Major League Rugby right now, all over the rugby world, and so you know, I'm really excited to be part of that process to share it with the world as well, and share everything that is American rugby with everyone out there. Yeah, we've had to wait 12 long months um, for for things to get back to normal, and there was a lot of umming and ahhing whether the season would be going ahead. Obviously, we lost Dallas, uh, who was supposed to be joining this year. And also we lost um, the home of rugby in terms of the Colorado Raptors as well, who have stepped down. But obviously we've been joined by the LLVT, LA Giltinis, who are an exciting prospect, uh, making big moves as well. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. A million and one things have been happening over the course of 12 months. But now we're into it as well. And we're seeing the fruits of the labor, people training hard, working hard behind the scenes, keeping in those COVID bubbles. And now we're seeing some top flight rugby at the weekend. Which games really caught your eye, Mikey? Uh, Foz, don't don't grow too big of a head here, but I really, really enjoyed the uh, the San Diego New York game. You know, I thought from the beginning when when that one popped up on the calendar, it's just uh, you know, it's just two exciting teams, West Coast, East Coast, sort of rivalry, and you know the talent that was on display on both sides was was just you know was exceptional, and uh, and it didn't disappoint. Right, it was a back and forth game the whole time. Uh, it was really awesome to uh, to watch. You know, it's a shame that a game like that couldn't have been played, you know, in, in the home of San Diego back in, uh, in their Legion Stadium or, or here in New York in front of a, you know, a, a solid fan base because that's what people want to see. But uh, as it was, he played in what that, that vortex it looks like of a hurricane in, L in Las Vegas. Just that's, uh, that looked like a lot of fun as a pullback. To... <laughs> That looks like a lot of fun. No bouncing balls this year, Mike. I was just going to say, did it bring back any horror mem horrible <laughs> memories for you from last year against New England? <laughs> they said they were going to play at the Sam Boy Stadium. I'd have said I'm not playing. I'd have had a tight hamstring that week. But um, <laughs> um, you know, a tough game against a good San Diego outfit who are only going to get better, to be honest. Um, I think they're missing a few cr crucial players. Rob Shaw still serving his ban that he picked up towards the end of his career in, in Europe. Um, Jay Peterson was a big influence on that team. You know, he plays either at, at fly half or fullback, but he always influences the game. He's very calm and uh, under pressure. So they're only going to get better. Delighted to get the win on the road. Rooney are looking strong. We've, we've recruited well. Um, and, you know, Rooney are in a really good spot at the moment. I think every year we've got better in terms of more professional. Our setup now is in Jersey City. Um, 
you know, a, a real talented bunch of players coming through, coached well. Sadly, we lost um, uh, Greg, our head coach, just before the season started for personal reasons. But, you know, we, you know, he's definitely stamped his sort of, his, he's, he's definitely stamped his kind of approval on the team. Like we are definitely running his shape, his sort of style of rugby. He recruited the guys in that can, you know, hopefully deliver that performance and, and, I have high hopes for us this season, but you know, everyone's probably saying that every team's sort of sitting there thinking after the first week, oh, we're looking good. Every, I think five of the six games were all within one score of each other. Um, obviously there was a draw down uh, in, in NOLA for uh, DC and NOLA, which is uh, always interesting. Um, the new boys in town, LL, LA Giltinis, you know, I think they've stolen the show. They've brought in all the big names, uh, Gitto, Ashley Cooper, um, you know, Langy Langy, all these, all these big superstars who are coming over to the MLR and, and joining, you know, the Hollywood team. Um, they definitely put on a performance of the weekend and, and sort of set their mark out. But it's going to be an exciting season. I think that um, every year, every year, the MLR is getting bigger and better. More stars are coming in. More players are coming through the, the grassroots. And, you know, even with the draft system being implemented this year as well, we're seeing some names come out of college college rugby and, and, and taking centre stage in the MLR. Who really caught your eye though, Mike? What's, 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 what's been good? What, what do you see from an outsider? Obviously, I'm a little bit biased still playing for, for the old Rooney, but you got to sit back in your armchair, you know, kick the feet up, enjoy a nice little brandy and uh, take in the, the weekend's festivities of rugby. No, look, I mean, you guys look fantastic. It, it's clear that Coach McWilliams left his legacy there in New York. I mean, the brand of rugby and the style you're playing was outstanding, even though it looked like you were playing like what, a hurricane, it looked like in Las Vegas. I mean, that was just, that must have brought back nightmares of last year in Las Vegas with that, <laughs> like with that first game against New England. I had to, it was, you know, I, I'm sitting there watching this game and I'm going, oh man, foes must be having flashbacks in the backfield, sitting back there, hoping that they don't <laughs> kick to them deep. <laughs> Give me the highlights of that, of that one you know, 30 seconds. <laughs> No, but like you said, that it was just such an exciting weekend of rugby across the board. I mean, close games all around, uh, with the exception of the Los Angeles game. I mean, but but really, wow. I mean, what what an exceptional team that is to watch. Just you turn it on even briefly, and and they didn't disappoint. You know, I mean, just moments of brilliance. Some really outstanding players. I mean, Canadian international Vandermeer just showing his class right off the bat. You know, I think he walked in two tries this weekend for them. Uh, first one in the team's history as well. So. You know, congratulations to Los Angeles. It's, it's exciting to have them in the league. Uh, I, I think they're going to bring a, uh, a lot of value to, uh, to this competition this season, and they'll definitely be one on the, the Western Conference to look out for, without a doubt. Yeah, one team that's really impressed me as well, that's probably goes a little bit under the radar, is, is Houston. Um, you know, I think that they are a really um, well-set-up team, what they've done down there, you know, building the stadium, investing in the foundations, getting good facilities, making it a, a great place to go and play at, an attractive place for players as well to come and stay and you know, knowing that they have those sort of facilities as well. And then also what they're doing in their sort of community outreach programs. I've, I've, I've watched them on Instagram and followed them online and stuff and just seeing that they're, you know, working with their community in terms of trying to build rugby. They're doing rugby workshops. The players are going to high schools. They're appearing on morning TV programs just sort of spreading the world of rugby. And I always thought, you know, what was missing was was the winning edge to it. You know, I thought their, their setup was really good and what they were doing was all positive. But, you know, every, everyone loves a winner. And I think Americans always love a winning team. And we've seen that now they're sort of in a position. You saw last year they started to make strides and they started to win a few games. But this year they've come out of the blocks flying, managed to get that early win uh, against a big team as well. So I think they're going to be a team to look out for. And, and how impressed were, were, were you with them? Oh, it, it, it's great you say that because I'm I'm a big fan of Houston and everything that they're doing down there. Like you said, they're, they're doing everything right, you know, and one of the main drivers in that is is a former USA teammate of mine who played a lot of rugby in your neck of the woods, Paul Emmerich. He's involved in the coaching setup there. You know, he's passionate about the American game. He loves what he does. He loves his job. He, he's excited to go to work every day. He's excited to share his love of rugby with his players. And I think that permeates within their team. And you can see that they're now starting to bring that onto the field with them. And they're, and they're playing an exciting style of rugby. They've got a good core group of players. And like you said, I mean, th those are world-class facilities. They may have one of the best setups in, in all of Major League Rugby right now. And, you know, if you're, if you're a player that's, that's grown up in America that wants to play professional rugby, like that's, that's the exemplar program right now. And, and if you're overseas and you want to come in and have a great taste of, 
of what Major League Rugby is all about. I mean, the Houston Sabercats are doing it down in Texas. So absolutely kudos to them. I think that, like you said, that's a team to look out for, hopefully throughout the season without question. And last but no means least, Mikey, that leads us on to the DC NOLA game. Um, a bit of a, a clangor in terms of ended in a draw. No one really likes a draw. But uh, both teams were pretty good. I thought DC looked pretty decent, um, especially their half but back looked very sharp, scored two tries. Uh, and NOLA, they're always a good side as well, which leads us nicely onto our, our first guest of the clubhouse. So, Mikey, over to you. <laughs> All right, folks, our first guest tonight is someone that I'm really excited to chat with. He's a former teammate of mine, former teammate of yours as well. USA International, capped 51 times with the national team with the Eagles, currently playing back row down in Nola Gold. He's a four-time All-American out of Life University, hails from the beautiful sunshine state of Florida down south, and we haven't even talked about his cowboy hat collection yet. Cam Dolan. What's up, Cam? How you doing, man? Hey, I'm good, man. Good to see you. Um... You know, I hope everyone's having a good week, and uh, I'm really excited about the show. Cam, I'm disappointed. Where's the, where's the cowboy hat? Um, this cowboy hat right here? There you go. Now it's I, got, a I got a couple more. Maybe we can do a little fashion show. I got a brown leather one, you know, <laughs> defense. It's very Keys Lansing-esque, I should say, but, you know, it, it, does, it, does, it does the job. That's outstanding. That's uh, uh, Cam, that's great. It, it, you're a man after my own heart with those cowboy hats. I got my own collection upstairs. It goes down really well when I walked around the city. I'm growing up. It, was, <laughs> it just fit right in. It was just like normal day walking down the street with a cowboy hat. Did it, it was did great. It, did it suit the dress code or Xavier? Yeah, no, nah, yeah, actually, it was, it was standard. Like, it was it was issued by the school. You must wear this cowboy hat to school. <laughs> you can both wear cowboy hats. <laughs> Uh, how you feeling, big man? Big first weekend for everybody. We just talked about how Fode was really sore after the first game, and he wasn't even going to show up tonight, he said. So how you doing? You doing all right? Uh, yeah, I'm doing all right. Uh, you know, I tell you what, I'm in my 30s now, and it's it, it's definitely tough to recover. Like it, Usually, like, by about now, I'd be like, all right, now I'm starting to feel good. Now I'm still sti stiff as I was at the start of the day. You, you get no sympathy here, pal. Not from me and Fode. You're barking up the wrong tree here. Speaking to the choir, my friend. <laughs> That's true. That is true. I can't say much. You guys got to... You're in your prime, Cam. You're in your prime. I'm, yeah, I'm limping off the field. I'm limping on the field and then limp my crawling off it. So, <laughs> three years left in the year. Yeah, kid. That's fair. That's fair. I'm just, I just, I'm just slowly going to have to start moving up uh, in the pack. I'm probably got another year. I'll get back into the second row, I imagine. Well, interesting enough, I've read that you started out on the wing. Um, I play in, in in college. I played three games on the wing. I had just come back from an ACL injury, and our uh, our back row was playing really well. And um, we had a very good um, back row named uh, Paris Hollis, who basically, if it was scrums, I'd be on the wing and um, line outs. I would just basically jump in line outs and then just stay on the wing. Paris, a life stalwart, man. Yeah. Name I haven't heard in a long time. But, hey, you got to show those skills, those those wing skills when we played the Maori All Blacks down in Philly that time. We just had that, like, distance breakaway try. I mean, that that was, like, that was incredible, man. I, I Just thinking back to that, like, no surprise you played on the wing. I mean, you've got some serious speed there behind you. Yeah, I got. I think I got to credit that to my, my folks and their uh, athletic, uh, you know, all the athletics they did in their youth. My dad was a, a, a pretty good high jumper back in his day, so. High jumper and a 440 hurdler. I heard your dad uh, was a tennis player as well. And when you told him that you were getting into rugby, that he went and bought the book Rugby for Dummies so he could read up and actually learn about the sport that his son was going to dive headfirst into. Is that true? That, yeah, very true. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> no, I, I don't think I know any bigger rugby fans than, than my dad. And he'll be ecstatic that we're talking about him on the show. So <laughs> 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 I bet he can't wait to put it all over his Facebook. That's for sure. Well, tell us about how you got into rugby, first and foremost, then, Cam, because obviously you just mentioned that your dad wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that was family-fed. It's something that you found on your own. What kind of age did you start, and when did you think, you know, there's a pathway for you to sort of carve out a career? Um, so I don't know if you guys are familiar. Maybe, maybe Mike, you might be familiar with him. Um, a guy in Memphis, he, he started up that, that inner-city Memphis rugby uh, program, Shane Young. Yep. So Shane, Shane Young and I went to the same high school together. We were in the same same grade. and. We both played football together, you know, freshman year. We both were like, eh, we don't know if this is for us. And, you know, we were like, we were, you know, cordial. I wouldn't say we were like, you know, like, like close friends or anything. But, you know, we had a couple of classes together. And I think it was like algebra two my junior year. And he was like, hey, man, um, 
do you want to come out to uh, rugby practice? And I was like, man, I, I didn't play a sport my sophomore year. I was like, oh, I might, might as well give it a go. Um, and went out to my first practice and just absolutely fell in love with it. And all we really did was just play touch and fitness for the first like month. And I just, I couldn't get enough of it. And then, you know, to, to the next question, um, Fodes, it must've been, it must've been uh, like January. So I had started playing in like October or November of 2006. And then it was like January of 2007. So, you know, two or three months, I, I was still extremely raw and fresh to the game. And um, uh, Sean O'Leary was down scouting for his under-17 team uh, for the following year. He had already kind of had his, you know, uh, 30, 30 guys. I think he had like 35 and he was cutting it down and invited me to a camp. And it was just kind of all, uh, you know, full steam ahead from there. Went to, Mil went to that Millfield Festival tournament. I don't know. If you guys mm -hmm. familiar with that at all? You probably yeah. are. Foods. Yeah. Competitions um, run every year. Yeah, exactly. And it's and it's a it's a great tournament. Uh, you know, it's good for you know age grade stuff. And uh, then moved to England and lived in Cheltenham for six months uh, for school and played some club uh, rugby in Gloucester. Played like uh, played Gloucestershire under 18s uh, and then got a uh, you know got fortunate enough to go to Life University and, and play under Scott Lawrence and then eventually Dan Payne. For me, it's, it's very interesting that, that American sport has that big presence in, in high schools and in universities where the big competitions. And so I'm excited to sort of learn about how, you know, state championships have sort of won or how it's, you know, this D1, D2 level and all that sort uh -huh. of thing. Can you explain that? Yeah, so in, in high school, um, I mean, Florida's not a very big rugby state. I think we had maybe eight or nine teams in the closest the closest school was uh, two hours away. So uh, we played like, you know, we, it wasn't a, not a whole lot of rugby. I know, I know when I was living in, when I was, when I was in school in sixth form in, in Cheltenham, I think I played like, I ended up playing like 30 games in about 20 weeks. I was like, you know, between, between school, um, between like school club and then, um, you know, like, like uh, counties. Yeah. Yeah. It was, like, and that was what I think was, you know, what, what kind of helped me the most is being able to play all that rugby within like my first year. And it was like a, you know, a decent, a decent level. Um, uh, but, you know, it when, you know, you have your, you have your like normal season, everyone plays everyone, uh, you know, you play like your eight games or whatever. And then I think it was like top four play, you play like the, the top two play a host semifinals and then, um, and then you play your, and then you play your final, and whoever wins that is kind of state champion. And then, as far as college goes, you have, you know, you got, um, you know, your Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, um, which is with all sports, um, you know, in, in college, and it's it's all based on kind of like skill level. Um, you know, you don't want you don't want like a division. Same thing with like like club rugby would be in England, like you don't want Division Two college kids playing against. You know, Division One. I, I don't like for for you know uh, Americans here. Like you're not going to want like a, um, you know, if you're playing if like if like Florida A and M University is playing Alabama every weekend, they're going to get trounced by sixty points every weekend. That's just no fun for anyone. So, so that's kind of how they do their levels. So do the do the colleges um, actively try and recruit rugby players? Is there is there that kind of I, obviously, you know, me being an English guy following American sports, you know, there's big american football teams as big as basketball teams in terms of college who like actively recruit give scholarships and that sort of thing does that exist in rugby here over here yeah it, it, i'd say in the last decade it's definitely um definitely picked up i think you know when i was leaving high school it wasn't really there wasn't really that much like recruiting i know um peaches with the penn state who are, who've always been a, a pretty good team they've always been like a top 10 team but I don't know. Did they do much recruiting? Did you do any recruiting, or did you just go there because you knew it was like the best rugby school in the Northeast? They, I, I had a relationship with their coach, and I knew, like you uh, said, that Don they had Harrell. a really good program there. Yeah, yeah. So at Penn State, so I had I had a warm introduction. I had some friends that went there that I was playing the USA U nineteen team with, and right. spoke very highly of the program. So for me, it was it was the perfect perfect place that I wanted to be. Yeah. So there was some, there was some bit of recruiting, but not in the formal way. If you think of like NCAA. Yeah. type of traditional college sports recruiting yeah so it's i think i think when i first got to life university we didn't actually have a, a, a college team it was you know life university is 
mainly a, a grad school, or it was when I first got there. You know, we maybe had like 1,200 undergrad students. And we had, we had men's NA, NAIA basketball, and we had the, the Super League rugby team. Like Super League was basically uh, an amateur, higher end level uh, rugby league here in America. And so I played on that my first couple of years. And then, and then Dan Payne started the undergrad program and it kind of, life kind of made that switch from like, you know, grad school, Super League to we want to focus, you know, primarily on undergraduate now. And, you know, they've been great since then. And, you know, since then too, you've got teams like Davenport and um, Linda Wood have, have come on the scene and, and you know, have, have you know, kind of done the same thing life did. They kind of took it, took, took it by the horns and said, okay, we're going to actively recruit. We're going to, we're going to offer scholarship opportunities. We're going to try to offer scholarship opportunities for, for, um, or at least enrollment opportunities for, for players from different countries. And I think, you know, I think, I think it's been awesome for American rugby as a whole. So why NOLA? Why, why New Orleans? What attracted you to go to there and, and, and play in the MLR for the NOLA goal? Um, I actually, before I went to San Diego, I had reached out to, I, I had a relationship with, uh, Nate, with Nate uh, Osborne down here, you know, uh, Peaches. He was our backs coach during the 2015 World Cup. Um, and so I, I had known him previously and, you know, being from Florida and going to college in Atlanta, like I, I just, lo I love the South and I love everything the South uh, kind of represents and stands for, like that, that, that Southern uh, hospitality, warm, warm weather, Fattening foods. Uh, that's that's kind of my my cup of tea. Um, I want to be able to play golf. I want to be able to play golf twelve months a year. And cup of tea is Foden's thing, dude. You can't you can't take that one. That's that's the stuff. <laughs> no, cup of tea of, is Foden's. Cup, 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 of, cup, of, cup of ice sweet tea. It's totally sweet different. tea. All right, totally, all right, totally sweet different. Tea. All right. Spend a bit of time okay. in Cam. I'm sure you enjoy a nice cup of tea in the morning as well. Like yeah. So uh, and after the first year, um, you know, I, I you know. Um, Holy and I had a chat and I was like, and we were just like, uh, it wasn't like there was any disagreements. I just don't think we, we saw eye to eye kind of thing. Um, you know, he's a great coach. We just didn't see eye to eye. And I was like, all right, sweet. I'm going to go kind of look elsewhere. And I went to, actually went to Nottingham for a month, uh, for, uh, just as injury cover and ended up playing like four matches in the championship, which was, uh, actually a, a a ton of fun. I loved it up there. They had an awesome culture and a great coaching staff. And, you know, as one of the lower funded teams, I guess you could say in the championship, they, you know, they got they had some, some awesome players and it was a, a really good time. And we, you know, we had some good wins. We'd be Ealing at home, which was always exciting. And, um, it, it doesn't then, Nottingham University has a four to one female to male ratio either. Does it count? No, no, it has not. I has nothing to do. I didn't know that until I got there. I swear. I didn't do any research. No, they, uh, and then when I, when I was there, I had reached out to, uh, Nate and, uh, <clears throat> Fitzy, our GM here called me. I was on a train like at like seven o'clock at night there. So it must've been, you know, at one o'clock in the afternoon here. And he's like, Hey, hey brother. Uh, <laughs> Hey brother. I heard you're, uh, you know, you'd be interested in coming to NOLA. I was like, yeah, man, I'd love it. I've, I had never even been to New Orleans in my life. I was like, I've just heard such good things about the city. Um, you know, I knew a few of the boys like Timmy Maupin, um, you know, I, I knew Cam Falcon, uh, from, uh, a couple of the old ARC tours they used to do up in Victoria. And then, um, you know, it was, you know, I, was, I wanted him get into something, something new San Diego as a whole, uh, like the city, like people are like, Oh, I love San Diego and San Diego is awesome. But I think, I think I got spoiled with Florida, Florida beaches and San Diego beaches and cold water just didn't do it for me. I wanted like relaxing beaches and <laughs> I'm not part of that. I, I can't get into the surfing. I'm not any good at it. So I'm just like, I'm just going to, I'm going to hold back on that one. Uh, and the traffic, the traffic all, uh, all day, every day was just a disaster. I, I just, I was like, I can't do this. This is stressful. More, <laughs> but really, really what you're saying though, is that Nate called you up Nate, and he was like, Hey, listen, Cam, we're going to get you out of the back row. We're going to put you on the wing down here in NOLA. <laughs> he, keeps, he keeps dang on that carrot, putting you on the wing in front of well, you. He actually, he actually know? told me how, he was going to play me a fullback and I was going to be able to kick for post. And I got here and I was like, <laughs> lie detector determined that was a lie. Uh, you, you meant it. So you, you brought up, you brought up Fitzy, Ryan Fitzgerald, the GM down at NOLA. Mm -hmm. Did you know that Ryan and I played together yeah. when we were like 18, 19 years old, a long time yeah. ago. Yeah, Outstanding right. guy. U USA he brings a wealth of experience. Right? Yeah, USA that, the nineteenth wealth of experience. That, worked. What's that? I was gonna say he worked in the NFL, right? Like so, he brings this whole new level of professionalism to Nola that I think 
you know, anyone that I've spoken to that that's, that's had an opportunity to work with Ryan really just, just speaks so highly of him and his presentation of the NOLA program. So it's no surprise that they were able to attract talent like yourself down there. Yeah. I mean, he was a, he was a, a scout in the NFL. I think, uh, I don't know if he was a scout for the Browns or the Colts, maybe. Anyways, he was a, he was a, he was a regional scout. And so every weekend he was driving to these universities and scouting these college kids that, you know, or, or, potential to get to the NFL and that was like his side gig while he was playing men's club down here and working you know at the lumber yard so I mean he's a, he's an ex he's an ex marine so you know he, yeah. he he runs things differently than you know most athletes are probably I mean it could be you can kind of you can compare it but it is way different it's much more like strict with with military than it is with with rugby and you know it's kind of like a just get on with it and do it. Like there's no like, oh well, let's let's chat about this. He's like, no, let's just put our head down and let's just do it. Which I which I love, and I think I think that matches the city vibe as well. Just New Orleans as a whole is kind of like a, you know, like a, a tough, you know, you know, hard nosed city. That's it's gritty. Like it's not like a, you know, you you don't come here and, and see lav lavish buildings and like these big Malibu homes. It's like a you know, it's a it's a it's a gritty city, and it's and it's and and I love it for it. And everyone's just awesome. Like the culture is amazing. What's it like to be a professional rugby player at Northampton and and in, in Cardiff with the Cardiff Blues? What's it like to live there, to play there, to experience the culture, and to just be a professional athlete? Uh, well, it was, it was it was definitely uh, it was definitely exciting for one. But you know, I, I got to New, I got to Northampton halfway through their season, and I went literally straight from college to you know the the who at the time was the, the, you know, top of the table in the, in the premiership. I think it was, yeah, it was Aviva. It wasn't, it was, it was already Aviva. It wasn't Guinness at the time. Wonder years can be called them. Wonder years. <laughs> exactly. Wonder years. You know, foes, foes was, uh, you know, start starting at fullback and they had probably, I mean, they probably, or I'd say 11 of their starters were internationals. Like, you know, George, George North on the wing, you got the PC brothers, uh, Steven Myler is, one of the best tens I've ever played with, if not the best ten I've ever played with. Uh, obviously, AJ is making a his case this year with his um, his Premiership, uh, you know, season he's having. Um, but you know, you had you had you had Lee at nine and Khan Foto Ali at nine, and then you know the whole basically the whole starting pack was internationals, and it was just you know going straight from college to then that kind of program with you know run by Jim Mallander was just such an eye opening experience. Like what you th what I thought I was good at, I was not. Like I was, I, I was, I was, you know, I was okay at it, but like there was guys who could just, they could do it all. And I think it definitely humbled me quite a bit. And that's definitely what I needed, you know, coming out of college at a, as a you know, cocky little 22, 23 year old who, you know, just got his first cap and, you know, was always kind of, you know, always one of the, the bigger, faster, you know, more athletic guys to then going over there and, and, you know, taking my slice on humble pie was, was awesome. And then, you know, we, we were, a great forward pack you know i think half the team's tries that year came off of off of malls and so i got to i got to be on the defensive end of those at practice every day and the old dorian west shirt off in <laughs> shirts, in 30, off. shirts off mauling in 38 degree uh, 38 degree fahrenheit i was never more happy rain. when i saw you guys doing that i honestly it just cemented the fact that i never wanted to be a forward ever and if someone tried to make me play in the forwards, I wouldn't have played in the forwards. So Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon, shirt off, raining, wind, windy as hell, thirty-eight degrees Fahrenheit, and you're mauling for twenty minutes because <laughs> because he, he, he didn't want people like grabbing jerseys and doing this. Like you had to like you know he he was an old old school you know Lester Hooker and he just like you know shoulders into everything like don't grab like you just hit hard parts all day and that's, I mean it toughens you up that's for sure. Was there a big difference, Cam, when you? You know, you mentioned that obviously you're coming out straight out of, of of school and then going to a professional club like that. Is there a big difference in the professional environment that you went into at Northampton and the one even today you with Nola, or have, uh, have the sort of instilled that now in the MLR that the sort of the, the levels that they've caught up American rugby is catching up with with the Premiership? Well, for, fortunately, at life, uh, Dan Payne was, you know, he was he just he was very and scott lawrence i mean scott lawrence was there then dan Payne ran the undergrad like all day every day kind of thing whereas before it was just tuesday thursdays and friday like evening training at seven o'clock so obviously it was a little different uh then but then when it went, when it went undergrad like it was it was basically a fully professional setup you know you had you had mandatory gym either either at eight 
eight to nine or, or, or like 10 to 11, depending on your class schedule. Then you had team meeting at two 30, then you train three to five, and then you'd have to come in a couple of times, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and then team run Friday game, Saturday, like, like most professional teams. And, um, you know, uh, I think, I think that was kind of, that was definitely good for me. I don't think a lot of college rugby teams get that kind of, um, set up here in the state. So, for, um, for our viewers out there, Cam, just to cut you up real quick, just so everyone's aware, the two names he keeps throwing out there, Scott Lawrence and Dan Payne, I mean, both former USA Eagles. Dan Payne, I mean, will, like literally one of the best college wrestlers that had ever wrestled in the United States at one point in his life, uh, was just on the cusp of the Olympics himself. Um, but Scott Lawrence is also now the head coach at uh, Rugby ATL down in the Major League Rugby. Uh, and Dan Payne is now the CEO of North American rugby or rugby North America's right so I mean you're talking about a, an institution down at life university that like that that's quite a legacy to have yeah. running the show down there you know what I mean it's it's no surprise that you've got that level of professionalism yeah de yeah definitely and I think just having those guys as mentors and they're two totally opposite you know opposite personalities and I think I think they just mesh really well together too you know you got a little bit more of like the Scott was like do this man of very few words but you, you definitely did it, especially as a young kid coming out of high school. You listened to him. You go, oh, yes, sir. Okay, yeah, I'll do it. And then Dan was more of like the, you know, the he'll tell you why we're doing it, like theory behind the mad. He'll tell you his like theory behind the madness of why we're doing stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, and, and they were great. And then, you know, to kind of pick up where we where we were, um, you know, it was basically kind of the same schedule, um, you know, at Northampton as I had in college. It was obviously a bit a bit more, you know, review. Um, you know, less drills and more just like kind of let's just keep getting these repetitions and getting that flow together. Um, and yeah, it was it was an awesome time. And I think my time at Northampton, um, you know, it was 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 kind of priceless. Um, you know, I, I learned so much then. And then I was able to, you know, after a year and a half there, able to go to, to Cardiff and, and actually start playing some games. And, um, you know, Cardiff was a was an amazing city and it was an awesome team as well. What's your experience like playing for USA, getting called into that setup, and your journey through through playing international being and, and attending World Cups? Uh, yeah, it was just I out of out of college. Um, you know, I got called up after my you know my my kind of fifth year, my super senior year, my fifth year. Uh, you know, fortunate enough to do that with rugby year, and you know, I kind of got my I got into my first camp, and I you know impressed the coaches enough to get called to a second, and you know I had a, I had a, a really good game against the uh, the New Zealand Maori in November of 13 and it just kind of all you know it just kind of you know I obviously it was like you know I, I worked hard and I was dedicated and, and passionate about it but you know I just I was fortunate enough knock on wood to be able to do it now for what 50, 51 times for our uh, for our amazing country and how do you find the World Cups going down uh, you went to you did the England World Cup in 2015 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Japan in nineteen, two thousand and nineteen. That must have been. Um, yeah, yeah. It was you know two again two to totally opposite places. Um, you know England's you know the the home of rugby. It's where it all started, and you know it was a it was a great tournament. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know we weren't we were close to a couple wins, but couldn't couldn't pull it out. And you know, you know our, our prep was pretty good for the most part, and. You know, kind of same thing in 2019. Uh, you know, in 2018, we we won like 10 of 11 of our uh, test matches that year. You know, we beat we beat Samoa for the first time in who knows how long, and we beat you know we beat Scotland, the first tier one nation we we've, we've beaten since you know they started doing the tiers, and, and that was an awesome year for us. And then, you know, we kind of had a falling out in that that um, 2019 um, uh, American Rugby Championships, and we. we Still had a good had a good summer tour. Uh, you know, played Canada twice and, and came out with wins, beat Samoa and Fiji and lost a fairly close one to Japan and Fiji. And you know, as you know, Japan what made the they make the final four? They lose in the quarters. Yeah, they lost it. No, they lost in the semis. They they won the they won the quarter final. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So you know, they're they're, they're you know, they're they're doing things right there and uh you know my, my hats off to them for, for one you know the way that where their team is at compared to you know eight years ago is you know miles above you know or kind of they're miles above where they were you know eight years ago and 
you know, in Japan as a whole, Japan Rugby Union, I think, put on an awesome, awesome World Cup. And I think it was, I think it was as enjoyable for the fans as it was for the players. Does that excite you about American rugby, though? Just because, for me, that's the sort of trend they're following. The Jap Japan mm -hmm. have now got a professional league and they bring in a few oh. players and, and they're starting to grow their home talent and obviously hosting the World Cup. There's rumours that America are hopefully going to host the World Cup in the next eight to 12 years. Uh, and now the MLR sort of integrated. It seems like it's healthy. It's bringing through good players. Does that excite you about where USA rugby is heading? Oh, I mean, 100%. I mean, we're America's maybe the it's the biggest sports um, you know has the biggest sports platform of any country in the in the world you know you've got between the big five uh, you know with like um, you know NFL NBA uh, Major League Baseball hockey uh, and now MLS is absolutely booming after twenty years um, you know they're paying they're paying players you know millions and tens of millions of dollars I, I don't know how much Beckham and Ibrahimovic were making but you know I. It had to be in the. It had to be in like the tens of millions, I would imagine. But like, but even when it, even not even from the money side of things, just the 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 talent that the U.S. you know U.S. you know started to bring up. Unfortunately, they've, they've fallen off the last couple of years. But to see where they were twenty years ago to you know what what they did in the two thousand fourteen World Cup was, you know, amazing. I think I think if rugby can kind of follow that same trend, I think I think you're just going to excite more fans. I mean, America. Uh, I mean, the thing is, fans fans are only going to watch things that are exciting. Uh, they're they're presented well. Um, you know, they're professional in all aspects, whether it be the broadcast, the 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 coaching, the players, the you know, the, the refereeing. Even like, if we can if we can keep a trend on on you know a, an upward trend on that, I think I think it's going to be fantastic. And I think that trickles down to once once players once once kids see that you can you can be a professional athlete playing rugby, I think it'll get bigger. It'll get bigger in the schools at, at youth ages, and then that that means high schools will become more popular, and it means colleges, and then you have, even if they're not professional, I think, you know, you you allow you allow kids to get scholarships to then attend universities and and educate. I think is, you know, educating our youth and and having passion for something else, you know, bigger than themselves. I think is is an amazing, um, you know, opportunity as well. Yeah, it's a Cam. It's a it's about that pathway, isn't it? Like we we know, you know, like it's. It's about as the young kids looking towards professional rugby now. One of the questions I was going to ask earlier is like, obviously it's amazing to play for Northampton, right? Obviously it's amazing to play for Cardiff, but how great does it feel to to get that phone call that there's professional rugby back home in the states and you can come home and play on your in your own borders and and get paid to play the game you love? I mean, how how amazing is that, right? Like, it's just it's that that's what we dreamed of when we were kids, right? Like we used to look at the leagues that Fodum was in and with the premiership and super rugby and everything else. But now, you know, the, the dream for kids is going to be hopefully playing in major league rugby. And uh, I think I, I read a piece, I think recently by former Bath uh, number eight and USA Eagle legend, Dan Lyle, uh, that was just talking about how, you know, the, the, the delicate balance that USA rugby or no, sorry, that major league rugby is going to have to walk now is, is the development of USA talent in conjunction with bringing in those big high profile players, right? Like we want to make sure that we bring in the right talent that's going to help boost, like you said, the players that are in the league to develop the American talent and not sort of mask them and hide them and have them play second fiddle. You know, you want the American players to be more prominent in the future. You want the American players to be really an important part of this league development. And hopefully Overall, it'll be good for the game of rugby across the board in the United States, right? Like you're talking about, like you said, the youth game, the women's game, the college game, like everything hopefully can ride on the coattails of the success of Major, major League Rugby in the coming years. And, uh, you know, th that's the stuff that excites people like you, people like me, and and even Fodes now, right? There's a reason why Fodes is here too. You know, he sees he sees the opportunity here, and and here he is sitting in his green chair in New York City. <laughs> so the complete 180 in the last four or five years. You two both know because you both went overseas to Europe or into the Magnus League to play to play rugby, learn your trade. And now it's sort of the other way around now. Now America's got hold of it. The excitement around the MLR, excitement of rugby actually growing and becoming professional, competing with the likes of the Premiership is bringing everyone from Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, England, France. I think everyone's getting involved. So, you know, it's, it's in a really good, healthy place. But like you said, Cam, they do. They need to grow, you know, the young American talent, grow the fans. That's the tough thing as well, because we have all these eyes from you know, the European leagues, everyone looking at the MLR, waiting for it to kick off. But we've got to 
you've got to grow the game from you know from the grassroots. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And and uh, you know ob obviously someone coming in, I haven't experienced that. You two have. How is grassroots rugby in America? Um, I mean, Mike, you, you might know a little different in New York. You know, it's a little bit more densely populated, um, you know, area as far as New York City and, um, but Florida, Florida as a whole is just there's some there's some amazing rugby players down there, um, you know, and there are a couple like good youth and high school programs, but you know, as a whole, it, it's it's tough because, you know, you've got it's such a a large area to only have eight or nine teams, you know, kids don't want to travel, take their whole Saturday on a bus for three hours and then play a game and then bus back for three hours, like every, you know, every weekend and you only get eight games in a, a year. That's not, you know, even if you play all four years, you're only getting 32 games, your entire, you know, high school career. So I know it, it's, it's tough, but um, you know, I, and I don't have the answers. Um, you know, I know it's definitely picking up in, uh, you know, other parts of the country, you know, California is absolutely booming. When I was living in San Diego, their, their youth program that, that Matt Hawkins had running down there was just like, there was like 160 kids under the ages of 15 that were in this like San Diego there, youth rugby. Is there an emphasis at NOLA to sort of try and build that rugby community? Are you guys, uh, you know, actively going to high schools? Yeah. And you, you know, obviously, because there was a big thing about building a fan base, but obviously, like you said, it, it needs to come from people, kids playing rugby and mm -hmm knowing that there's rugby about to sort of you know quench that first for it so we actually uh we've, we've actually done you know as a program have done really well um you know that's one big thing for our owner tim falcon that he wants to like he wants to grow a you know grow the youth rugby in, in, in new orleans and louisiana as a whole um and i know nick feeks unfortunately had a, a you know an, an injury um at the world tent that the tens they had in bermuda so you know, but, but even before that, he was uh, doing an awesome job. Uh, you know, he basically runs the youth programs and they have, you know, three or four different clinics every week, like around the city that kids come to. And I don't know. I don't know if they're free for kids or they're just I know they're very inexpensive if they're if they if they aren't free, you know, maybe like five or ten bucks for, you know, a couple hours, um, you know, to learn the game. And, that, and that's all ages and all, all boys and girls, all everyone playing together and learning it, you know, a little fun you know, drills for, you know, kids under the age of kind of, you know, 13, that kind of like seven to 13 age range. And they get really, and they get really good turnouts. Good. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, definitely picked up even since I've been here in the, what, two and a half years I've been here. So, so Cam, you mentioned all these kids, right, that are, that are getting involved in the game. I mean, they're looking up to players like you and, and, you know, they, they, they want to be like Cam Dolan when they get older, right? Like, what is that like? What's it like? to play in major league rugby, to travel around the United States and be a professional rugby player and be a professional athlete. What, what, what is, what's your typical day? Like what's your typical week? Like, uh, well, you know, I, I think any, any kid who grows up playing sports, you know, when, when they ask you what you want to be when you get older, like some, some kids say firefighter, doctor, like if you were good at sports to grow up, you want to be a professional athlete. So to be able to kind of live that dream is, is, you know, amazing. I wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, and you know, I think rugby, especially in New Orleans, is, is definitely picking up. Like, there's been times where I might, even if I have just like a Nola Gold hat on, um, people will be like, "Hey, go Gold!" You're like, "Oh wow!" Just like random guy on the street. I was like, "This is," I'm like, "This is awesome." And I was with, uh, <clears throat> we were walking in, um, we were watching a Mardi Gras parade last year. Um, me and Cam Falcon. This guy's like, "Hey." I hope you guys kick ass this weekend, you know, take it to, I forgot who we were playing in San Diego. They're like, I hope you, I hope you guys whoop San Diego this weekend. I was like, I was like, Oh, thanks man. I was like, Cam, do you know that guy? Cause obviously Cam Falcon grew up here and he's like, I've never seen him in my life. I was like, well, this is, that's, I was like, that's awesome. So like that for us is amazing to just even see like the popularity grow. Um, and then, you know, as far as you say, our normal week, um, Monday's usually like a light, um, uh, recovery day film review of the game you played uh tuesday's your you know and then by the end of monday you've kind of put that past weekend's game to to bed you know you, you said okay what do we do good what do we do bad what do we need to improve on um and then tuesday you are you already start your kind of um analysis of the the and prep for the the week ahead so um you know tomorrow we'll go in you know it's a weird week for us it's short tomorrow we'll go in and we'll review the dc game we'll see what we did good, what we did bad. And then, and then we'll, we'll probably go straight into uh, prepping for, for New York. So I'll, I'll get to watch film on, on Fodes all day. So that'll be fun. <laughs>
You can't see him. He's in the back. He's, he's way uh, in the back. Where, I'll, just be, I'll just be like, att- I'll be like, attack <laughs> that old man. <laughs> <laughs> kick it down. I don't kick it down. So you still got a little bit of pace. I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, no. And then, so we'll have, you know, gym, gyms three days a week, Monday, you know, well, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for us, usually and off Thursday. And then a pretty fast team run on Friday where we actually do get, you know, high speed meters in and, a little primer lift in the morning, but Tuesday's usually our tough day. You know, that's when we do our live mauling. Luckily, um, our coach here lets us keep our, our jerseys on for our mauling sessions. So sometimes, <laughs> though, in I don't know if you've been down here in May or June, it's not nice. Like, it, it is hot and humid. Um, so sometimes I probably would rather take my shirt off. It's not 38 degrees in, you know, East, East Midlands, um, you know, winter weather, which is which is nice and kind of the reason I came down here. <laughs> I like that that heat and humidity. And then Tuesday we'll do our, you know, d- our breakdown work and our, our defense, and it's a big defensive uh, emphasis day. Uh, Wednesdays are, you know, units into like basically a, a high intensity, elongated, um, you know, map- mapping of the field. We call it where you know you run through like all your plays from, you know, each each zone of the field, a couple of kickoffs, and it's you know ball, you know, you're probably covering hopefully six, you know five to six thousand meters in that session. Um, and then like a Thursday is a well-deserved day off usually, especially I've noticed as I've gotten older, I've learned to appreciate those days off more. Uh, I don't golf as much on those days as I used to. <laughs> the lower back doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't like that. We told uh, you we're not, we're not buying it, mate. You're just, you're <laughs> yeah. But remember, remember that whole thing that you get to sit at the back and just kind of, Oh yeah. You guys do that too. <laughs> Come, you forget I played with you. You just sit on the wing with me, mate. We talking. That's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I mean, the way the game is designed now, the back rovers, you know, you want them on your edges. <laughs> so, and that's that's kind of our week: game day Saturday, and then Sunday uh, recover and and you know maybe uh try to hydrate, try to hydrate, try to stretch, get get moving again, and hopefully the body's ready to go by Monday. Well, let's talk about the the weekend as well, Cam, because you mentioned it already that uh, you know you had your opening game. Tough game. Um, the new boys, DC. Have you played? Did you play them last year? Yeah, we played them last year, and we, uh, you know, we, we we played a. You know, obviously it was their first game in the MLR, and you know we 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 gave them a a, a bit of a beating last year, and they came and and seeked redemption this year. But I mean, we we beat them last year, and then they went on to win their next four games, and I think we're mm-hmm. either in first or or damn close to first place in the East. Um, you know, when we unfortunately got shut down from COVID, so. Um, you know, they came down and they, and they, you know, they had some, you know, issues in the week with, uh, you know, like COVID protocol and stuff like that, I believe. And, um, you know, but they, they came down and they brought it and, you know, you know, much respect to them. I know they haven't been able to trade much and, um, you know, because of that, they had to, they had a really light week, if anything, all week. Um, you know, I got, I got a very, very talented, uh, back row. Um, they've got great, um, you know, uh, you know, halfback uh, combination there at nine and 10. And they've got some of the most, you know, one of the most dangerous back lines in the league and big, phys- big physical team, right? They, they, they uh, you know, we definitely shoulders are sore today uh, after yesterday. Hopefully, hopefully they're sore too, though. You know, like I said, it's a, that gritty city down here where you don't, you know, take things lightly. We do, we do meet things, uh, you know, you know, head up. So that's, that's good. But you know, they they got off to a good lead. They got off to a big lead, and we we came back late and managed to secure a draw with four four tries. So we're, we're not we're not too upset ab- about it. Obviously, we we didn't do everything we needed to. We didn't execute, um, you know, kind of what we trained. But that's rugby, and you know, kind of roll with the punches. Everyone's got, a, or as Mike Tyson said, I think it was Mike Tyson. Everyone's got a plan to get punched in the mouth. <laughs> okay, and so as an American. I know that Americans don't really like a draw. You no, know? it's like kiss, it's like kissing your sister. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't even have a sister. So obviously, I was talking about I was talking about this Chris McKean and my teammate and said, "Do you think it'll ever be a case in American rugby where they do sort of a similar NFL thing where you know maybe they do like a midfield scrum on the twenty-two uh, after you know after the final whistle it's a draw, so they blow the whistle and say, right, we're going to sort of sudden death like." You have a scrum on the twenty in the middle of the field of the twenty-two, and you have you know one phase of play. So, you know, well, as many phases you want until you knock on the ball or they turn over the ball or a penalty to give it to score a try, and then the other team. Do you reckon anything like that will ever come into rugby, or is 
I, I, would, I would love to see it happen. You know, college NFL is a little different. You know, you, you, you know, I think, I think they flip a coin again after the game and they say, you know, whether you want to kick or receive and you have 10 minutes, it's just 10 minutes, first team to score. Uh, basically, you know, if, if you kick a field goal in your first possession, then uh, the other team gets a chance. But if you score a touchdown in your first possession, game, game, game's just over. And, and college does it where they start at like 20, 20 or 25 yard line and you got, you know, and to, uh, you either turn it over, kick a field goal or score and they flip flop back and forth. And I actually think that would be awesome to basically say, yeah, you have a scrum on the opposition 22 and until you turn the ball over or, you know, or score. And then it, let's say you do score. The other team then has a chance to, to kind of re redeem themselves. But let's say you, you're on the defense. You, you want to defend first and you turn them over. So then now you get the ball. All you got to do is play a couple phases and slot, you know, slot, get in the pocket and kick them, drop the whole game over. So, you know, it might only be an extra, it could be 60 seconds of ball on play for all you know. You might lose that first scrum and then the other team's ball. They could go drop the ball and they win the game. So you've heard it here first on the USA Rugby Clubhouse. We're going to change the rules. <laughs> uh, gonna, Commissioner, Commissioner Killebrew is taking notes on the <laughs> rugby clubhouse show. He's got his notepad out. He's like, great. You got this? Just write this down. Did you catch that? <laughs> I mean, and, we, you know, we got these new rules this year. I think that would be really interesting, like the, the kick timer and the red card change, which is awesome. Um, yeah, the, the, the new rules are, are interesting, definitely. I didn't, uh, we didn't uh, – our, our coach kept telling us to uh, score it under the sticks when we were playing like a bit of broken field rugby. He kept going, score a seven pointer under the sticks. And I just kept going, what's he on about? And then yeah. only guys flying out to Vegas that I read that the rule changed that yeah. they have, like, the, there's, no, there's no kicks, just seven points and off you go. Well, uh, yeah, you know, us forwards talked about it and we're like, all right, backs, if, if, if we just, you know, had to maul for 10 meters and then you guys played a bunch of phases, like just, just run it in the middle, but then just score. <laughs> like we want, we want that extra sixteen seconds to the kick to get our breath back. <laughs> so we had a, we were, and even we we're talking to Carl, and he's like, "No, no, no, we gotta score in the middle, or else I don't get my my, my two points for the kick." <laughs> I'm like, "Screw your points, man! <laughs> I'm trying to keep my fitness levels high." So, Cam, another question as well. I always wanted, I always ask because one of the reasons that I came to the MLR is to sort of travel around America. It's a real good. One thing that I've always appreciated from rugby is it's taken me all around the world. And I love America, always loved America. And I, I did a bit of traveling here in my free time when I was off uh, in the summers with, in the premiership. But um, I love you know, bouncing around, going to New Orleans, seeing what the nightlife's there like, or going to San Diego, going to Vegas. What is your favorite stop on the MLR ro ro uh, roster so far? And if you could add somewhere, add another one, another team to the roster, where would it be? All right, so we obviously New Orleans. I live here, like that's a given, right? So we're not going to use that one. Yeah. Um, Can't pick your man, I, I, I mean, the, the weather in the weather in the weather in San Diego is great to play in because it's seventy to seventy three degrees and no humidity. So it's it's as far as rugby goes, it's great weather to play in. Um, and then I, I love I. I have a special, I didn't spend much time there. I spent about six months there, but I got a special place in my heart for, uh, for New York city and much like New Orleans, New York cities, you know, it's, you, it's gritty. You gotta be gritty. tough and you gotta be able to, you know, just roll, roll with the punches. No, you know, nothing's, it's not, there are fancy places, places in New York city, but as a whole, it's, you know, it's a, a big tough city and that's kind of what they're known for. Um, we call it the new New York hustle. But precisely, yeah. Where we're down here, it's, uh, it's much more relaxed and calm, and um, which I think is more my more my 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 kind of personality now. Um, but yeah, I'd say New York. Now I haven't, I've never, I've actually never been to Boston either. So um, that'll be an interesting one. Um, yeah. So I guess we'll 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 see. And then you know, Seattle obviously always has a great puts on a great venue, and their fans are their fans are great. I think what they've done up there. Uh, since the start of MLR is fantastic. I mean, my, or, like my, my first game in the MLR when the season started was San Diego at Seattle, and they were sold out crowd, like 5,000 people first game. I was like, this is – I was like, wow, is this, is this what everywhere's going to be like? This is – they've done an awesome job here. Fortunately, it's not everyone's like Seattle, but, um, you know, I'd say, I'd say at the moment New York and, you know, who knows what, what – I don't think Boston even got, has even had a home game yet in, in, in their existence, have they? So it'll be it'll be interesting to see what their venue's like. It's too cold yet. Yeah. We've got to wait for we've got to yeah, get, yeah, in June. <laughs> 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 um, 
Um, where would you like to see it? Uh, a oh yeah. Um, I would love to see a franchise either in Nashville. I think it would be really cool. Just or uh, yeah, again. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, what what? Why do I have them if I don't even get to wear them? You know, <laughs> or uh, or I'd actually love to see one in the uh, the city of brotherly love, because you know they, they had that CRC um, you know seventh tournament up there. I did that a couple times, and we've we've had a couple USA games, and Philly's just an awesome city, and they they put on a you know a great a great rugby venue, and I think as players that's that's always nice. By the way, because the brotherly love thing is straight over my English hat. Yeah, Philadelphia Foes. It's oh man, what a, what a city. I, uh, Cam, that that game we played against the Maori, like you said in 2013, and Philly has to go down. It's like yeah. one one of the greatest atmospheres you've ever played in. I would imagine. Oh, right? I mean, it's just like 100. percent I mean, and it was what 23,000 people there, but they're like, it, it's it's very like closed. It, it just feels everything feels close. And and like you said, I made that that run down the sideline and everyone like shot out of their seats because uh, it was off like a uh, an interception and man i've never i've actually like the ground was literally shaking when i was running like like you know you see in like football movies when they like any given sunday when they're making when they're like running and does like the helmet cam thing like that's what it looked like it was like like the whole stadium just felt like it was moving obviously i was young and probably my adrenaline was 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 you know through the roof it's but really interesting when you talk about those really big moments in your rugby career because I can do the same thing in certain moments mm -hmm. where like time stands still and yeah. all you can hear is sort of your breath and the hit of your feet on the, on the you know, the, the yeah. crowd is sort of like, you can feel them around you, but you can't necessarily hear them. It's such a weird. It's like a, it's like an ambient noise almost, huh? Yeah. It's so yeah. strange. It's so funny. You just said that. Just, yeah. It, I can look back at moments in my career and think the same. And, and, and you do, you get like that tunnel vision. It doesn't look like real life, but you're like, I think I'm doing this right. <laughs> <laughs> and next thing nah, you know, you're like, don't mess up. Don't mess up. <laughs> you're, you're either you either were running, you know, like your like your feet were in in cement, or you're you know flying and scoring, you know, a five pointer underneath the post. Now seven pointer. <laughs> you definitely had your tunnel vision on because I think I was not too far behind you, screaming, running after you, asking for the ball, and there was no there was no getting through to you. You were you were oh, possessed, just I was, running I was, down that line. I think I got I got I got caught with like I I got. I got chopped tackled from behind with like, or ankle tap for like two meters to go. And I was like, oh, it sucks. So that would have been such an awesome story if I could have scored that. Like that would have been a, just a, a great start to my, you know, first, you know, four months, you know, as an, as an Eagle. And, um, you know, it was a good game and we, we definitely put up a fight against them. And like you said, the crowd just made it so much better for us. And same thing goes with any game you play in. You know, when you get that crowd behind you, it, you you know, it, it does some magical things. And until you've been there, it's and, and actually experience the crowd like that. It's it's tough to really explain it or kind of know what someone's talking about. The old 16th man, they call yeah. it. Mm -hmm. I'm a I'm a Penn State guy too, so I know all about that 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 oh, Philly yeah. vibe and uh, that passion that they bring to all things sports in the state of Pennsylvania. But you know, again, Commissioner Kilbrew is taking notes in the background. Where are we putting the next MLR franchise? New sudden death rules, new team in Philadelphia. <laughs> it, it's all here, fellas. It's all here. It's it. Honestly, like it's it's like it's got to be Philly or Chicago. You think like those are two, you know? And the youth, the youth rugby in Pennsylvania is is good too. I believe at least it used to be really good. It is. There's yeah, a there's there's a very strong, a very very strong rugby community in Pennsylvania at all levels. The, you know, the men's game, the women's game, the youth game. I mean, it's it's a really really outstanding. Uh, rugby community throughout the entire state. Um, Cam, you mentioned, obviously, you keep mentioning that you're feeding all the old bones, but a question that, you know, you always get asked when you've sort of reached the age of 30, 31, and, you know, you've played in Europe, you've been to World Cups, you're playing for the Eagles, you're playing for NOLA. What else for you, personally, have you got left to achieve in the game? Um, I mean, I, I would love to play another World Cup. I think that would be amazing. Um, and I'd love to win, you know, an MLR championship. I think those are the two, two big, two big things left on my on my checklist before I kind of reevaluate what what I want to do, or you know what what my next uh, kind of goals are. Um, so you know, I just kind of taking it season by season, see how we go. You know, I, I definitely have a, a few more left in me, uh, and then after that, you know, then you just you know, it gets to that point where you just you, you say, all right, well, 
or I've gotten to this point and I feel like this. So I definitely at least have another year in me. And then you probably play another year and then you're like, all right, I got another year in me. And then, I mean, you, you probably know better than I would with that. <laughs> There's always one more year. But, but, you, get there, you set your mindset to a certain year and then it's always, mm-hmm. I could do one more. I could do one more. I mean, my, I, my peaches is, you, you know, <laughs> Mike, I feel like you retired like four times. Ah. Dude, I, feel, they, I feel like you retired after the World Cup of 2015. Then, then, you, then I see you're you're playing with Nyack, and then you come on with Rooney again. <laughs> Did you have any more caps after the World Cup of 2015? No, no, no. That that was that was uh, that was the end of the line for me, and 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 rightly so, right? Like uh, that was uh, that was definitely definitely the cap. And uh, but man, so so what you're saying is it's just like you know you just got to move further out. You got to get, get out of those single digit numbers, <laughs> move out to the double digits, like the 11s, the 15s, move to the outside, hang out on the wing more often with Bodes, and you can play till you're what, 38, Bodes? 37? Uh, listen, guys, there's 23 <laughs> numbers. There's 23. <laughs> That's right. Go even, go even further into the depth chart. Just 20, keep going. 23. Just keep going. <laughs> That's outstanding. Well, to close, uh, Cam, uh, we, we've kept you long enough. Um, but obviously, uh, from from one singer to another, who's telling you my secrets? Do I need to get my cowboy hat out again? Yeah, are you gonna get your cowboy hat? Cam, out? Cam, I've been on those buses. I've been on those buses. With you. It's, <laughs> look, look, look. All right. First of all, everyone can sing. Not everyone can sing great. Okay. okay. And 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 and, Fair. and, Fair. and be- beauty is in, in the uh, in the ear of the beholder. So, <laughs> <laughs> is that what we're saying? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm going to maybe kill, kill, maybe, kill, maybe, maybe kill will write that one down too. Cam, don't yeah, say, okay. Beauty is in the ear of the beholder. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just excited because I, I told photos at the beginning. This is what I signed up for. I, I thought I was coming on the X Factor here. So this is, I like, yeah. I, I, was wait, I was waiting for some vibes, some singing, some songwriting, some dancing. So so come on, Cam, what do you got? What, what, all, what right, you got all, right, all right, all right. Let me see what I can do. Okay. Let me set the mood. Let me set the mood. Oh, yes, Cam. I love yeah. it. I mean, I mean, as you know, you can't be a performer if you don't put on the whole show. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> and I know, showman. I know one thing from you: you are a showman. All right, and a one, and a two. Baby, lock them doors and turn them lights down low. Put some music on that's soft and slow. Baby, we ain't got no place to go. I hope you understand. I've been thinking about you all day long. <laughs> I'll leave you there. You know what, do you know what scares me, Cam? Is what scares me is the amount of times that you've probably sung that in your underwear to some <laughs> people in New Orleans, New York, Florida. See, I, I honestly would, but I can't. I can't play any instruments. I am so untalented when it comes to musical instruments. I, I my family just. None of us have none of us have that gene, and it, it, you know it's it's heartbreaking stuff. And I lose I lose sleep over it every night. Cam, all rugby players have that song gene, dude. It's just who we are. Every, every <laughs> rugby bus you've ever been on, you got to sing at some point, right? So it's like it's part of our nature. It's who, it's our culture. It's what we do. I am in a similar boat. None of my parents can sing, dance, do anything musical, or play any musical instruments. And there's me. <laughs> <laughs> If you want it, let's do it. Find it, not pony. it. Oh yeah, a little genuine. <laughs> oh, we're gonna. All right, so, all right, so, so I need, I need to know something, Fods. Um, I want to know if you're gonna boost my morale, or if I'm gonna have to run it straight with you this weekend. Do I, you know, from an X Factor perspective, do I, do I move on to the next round with my singing abilities? Of course, mate. You're already, you're already in my, you're already in my. All right, I might, I might, I might, I might uh, accidentally miss tackle and just give you a little. Actually, a couple of meters this weekend, then. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Just if you break one on one, chip and chase. Don't run over me. <laughs> chip and chase. Don't run around me. Don't run over me. Just run past me. You know, know knowing Nate and his uh, coaching style, he'd probably be like, yeah, mate, if it works, it works. Have a go. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas I've had coaches that'll be like, uh, not Cam, you're, uh, you're, you're done for the day. But we're three minutes in. He's like, yeah, no, you're done. You're well, done. Cam, you'll be. You'll okay. be, you'll be You'll be happy to know that we have, um, as an as another guest from another segment, uh, Nicole Scherzinger is popping on. So, Ooh. you know, she's uh, she's always looking for the next big musical thing. I think there's a place for you out in Nashville. That's still <sighs> the blue uh, thing. Maybe if they do like a maybe if they do like an athlete's um, American Idol, I might have a shot. I might make it past the first round, but I, I, 
as a betting man, uh, I'd probably say no. Sam, that's what this is. This whole this whole thing was just a build up to your audition for for the athlete American Idol. You just you just did it. How do you how do you feel? This, another idea. This is about. I've worked my whole life towards this. I, I was <laughs> raised on a ranch because of this. It wasn't it wasn't to learn how to how to how to barbed wire fences and, and and shovel horse manure. It was to learn the country way of life and and you know hopefully take my talents to Nashville. I love your optimism, Ken. As always, it is a pleasure, mate, seeing you. Um, always never fail to put a smile on my face. Uh, one, of the, one of the really good guys that I've had the pleasure to play with on the field, but also play against as well. Um, I wish you all the luck in the MLR season and your future endeavors in the rugby, mate. So take care and thank you very much for coming on the show. Likewise, brother. Thank you for the kind words and I uh, look forward to seeing you this weekend. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, Cam. Catch you soon, pal. Thanks, Peach. It's good to see you as always. I'm Troy Lockyer, and this is my Budgie Smuggler's Hidden Talent. What we're going to do is we're going to grab the Queen of Spades. We actually can just take the Queen of Spades, we give it a little shake, see it disappears. But as quickly as it disappears, we can actually make it reappear. You guys might be thinking, you know, you've seen a lot of card tricks. So I wanted to change it up, make it a bit different. Not make cards disappear, but actually try and make myself disappear. Watch this. I'm Troy Lockyer, and you're watching USA Rugby Clubhouse. All right, team, huddle up and bring it in. This is Coach Ty Daniel coming at you live and direct. Where do you see yourself for 2021? Sitting in that same chair, in that same outfit that you wore five days in a row, playing video games, watching the same Netflix reruns, mom and dad yelling at you? Or do you see yourself here, making a difference, defining yourself, playing club sports, pushing the boundaries, growing as a person, and more importantly, joining the Golden Flyer family. Nazareth College, we're passionate, we're strong, we bring that grit, we bring that fire and we know that you're passionate as well. We got through a pivotal year. Now we're looking for you to bring the change and help us grow. To come to college, you have to complete the process, and that starts with the application. Just like a rugby match, you have to take it step by step, minute by minute, second by second. You have to keep moving forward. We believe in you, but I need you to believe in yourself. Submit your application, because greatness is only one click away. Become a Golden Flyer, because it's always a great day to be a Golden Flyer. So I'm delighted to announce our next guest is a very good friend of mine, former rugby player of Glasgow Warriors, also Wasps and Scottish International, my X Factor friend and buddy, Mr. Tom Evans. Tom, how are you? I'm very good, Ben. Very good. It's lovely to see you again, looking so eloquent as always. <laughs> I've seen that you, uh, you've, you've, changed, you've changed Glasgow for the bright lights. And you've headed over to Hollywood. Uh, if I could have picked one player throughout my whole career who I'd have thought would have ended up in Hollywood, <laughs> Tom Evans, you would have been my number one pick. So how's life out there treating you anyway? Yeah, it's really good. Really good. Like you said, um, slightly different to the bright lights of Glasgow. But, you know, it's, it's the small things like waking up here with the blue skies uh, just, just puts you in, in such a great mood. Um, you know, and uh, and the way of life here, you know, it's very, people into their sports, everyone's sort of always seems to be outdoors and getting involved in, in, in various things. And I, I, I love it. Like um, I've been here now for a couple of months um, and I've got no plans to to leave really. <laughs> I, I feel you, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the West Coast. Obviously my heart's in the East Coast now, but the West Coast is a fantastic place to be. Tommy, I should ask you as well, what have you been up to since our dreams were crushed? <laughs> we were so close to winning the X Factor. I don't know, I should probably explain to our viewers that Tom and I, you know, we, we, we handed in the rugby boots for a little bit and, uh, and we tried to take the, take the stage of the X Factor with, a, with another rugby guy, Levi Davis, who plays for Bar back in England. And, uh, you know, we were hoping for that big record contract at the end of it, but sadly it wasn't to be. It was, just at our fingertips and we, we we let it slip by but um what an experience that was tommy one experience but ben what you've left out what you've very naively left out is the fact that this was our dream since we were 16 to be in this boy band 
Um, we had many discussions about it. We never really thought it was ever going to be possible. And then at 35 years of age, that dream came true. And boy, did we take it. Yeah, it was absolutely, honestly, I felt like a kid again. I felt like I was 16. Doing oh, it. I mean. To be with you, mate, was an absolute pleasure as well. You were a height of professionalism. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was, it was so much fun. It was so much fun. I, I had a wonderful time doing it. And uh, it seems like it was yesterday and it's just the time's flying by. It does. And it's crazy with everything that's happened in the world that, you know, had it been been a year previous, like we probably probably would never have got the opportunity. But yeah, it's like, it's one of those, I think, moments in my life that I'll never forget. I mean, you know, to, to be on that X Factor stage and to be doing it with with good friends like you and Levi, um, you know, it was just, it was such a buzz, wasn't it? And I'm just so grateful that we had the opportunity to to do it and sing The Greatest Showman in the semi-final, which was, oh, you so. know, on cake, so. Well, obviously, being a, being a singer was always the main aim, but but on the process to getting that opportunity, we had to play some rugby at some point, so. <laughs> I, I, want to yeah. back to you. I want to take you back to sort of your, your childhood because one thing that they're looking for over in the MLR is like crossover athletes. And they did it with the um, the sevens with Carlin Isles, Perry Baker, find some sprinters, took them away from sprinting and added them into the sevens mix. And, and obviously they excelled. And sort of your story is a little bit similar. I know you were a big track star when you were at Wellington College. You were a 200 meter runner. You went to the national championships. When did you start playing rugby and when when did you really know that that was going to be your play of trade? Uh, I, th I think when I was um, 15, really, like in, in the junior cults, uh, I realized then that my my career was going to be in rugby just because of, of the love I had for the game. And and like you said, like being being blessed with with speed, um, you know, that that freedom to to use it, you know, it, in a way that rugby allows, you know, like to to make that line break, to to be running full flight with the ball in hand, you know, like like you know, Ben, from from your playing days with with your speed that kind of came from nowhere. Um, uh, it's there there is no greater feeling. So athletics was always there, like you said, for me, um, but it was never like you know a realistic career choice um, because it didn't have the camaraderie that rugby has. It didn't have the the team aspect, you know, that we, you know, we love so much and, and everyone who plays loves so much. And um, actually it's what I miss the most not playing anymore is that, is that camaraderie. And I should mention as well that you have a brother, Max Evans, who also played for Scotland alongside you. But before he, he became a rugby player, he was a semi-professional golfer. And then he sort of followed in your footsteps because you were doing the the whole professional rugby thing and, and obviously got picked for Scotland and then suddenly Max popped on this uh, on the scene as well. Very athletic guy, he played in a different position than you and sort of started causing some waves. And then the next thing we know that both the Evans brothers are, are putting on the blue shirt and uh, and representing Scotland. So tell me about that. You know, you, one, your relationship with your brother through sport and two, you know, what it feels like to, to you know, represent your country with your brother standing alongside you. Yeah, you know, I, I've I've only got the one brother in Max, like you said, he's he's a year older. So um, we've always been lucky growing up and having that competitive, you know, spirit kind of in all sports that we've we've played against each other. And he's always been, you know, a real sort of role model for me. Um, you know, especially in his rugby career, you know, he was always, like I said, that year ahead. So he would, and he was he was the captain at Wellington. Um, so when I arrived, it was like, you know, I've always felt like I've tried to sort of emulate his his career. And then when we were lucky enough to play in the in the, the first team at, at Wellington for two years, um, it it was like memories that you know, like you know, from your school days, you you can never replace. And we always sort of like, you know, got the best performance out of each other. I think. You know, at the time he was playing scrum half and, and I was uh, on the wing, but at international rugby, he he moved into um, to the centre. So, so we were like very close to each other on the field, which was great. But like you said, Max uh, had a real bad back injury um, in his last year at Wellington. And he was told that his back would never sort of live up to club rugby or international level. So he went off and did his PGA 
um, golf course because my, my dad's a, a professional. And it was only when I started making waves at Wasps um, that he's really started missing the game and, and decided to, to come back and um, train with Margot Wells um, for, a, for a couple of months. And, and then it was through Sean and Ian really at the Glasgow Warriors who I was pretty close with. He was the head coach. Um, I told him about my brother and I said, look, you need to give this guy a trial. I know you've got a lot of guys on your books coming through, but you know, you, you need to at least give him a chance. And thankfully for Sean and Ian, he, he did. And um, Max came up and played for the Glasgow Hawks and, uh, and really earned his way into the, into the Glasgow Warriors setup. And it was really kind of unheard of. I, I never even thought when he, when he left rugby and went to go and play golf that we would ever have the opportunity to play rugby again, let alone club rugby or international level. And so when that opportunity came and we, you know, started playing together for the Glasgow Warriors and, and, and for Scotland, it, it was really memories that I'll, I'll never forget, you know, playing, playing for your club or playing, you know, especially international rugby is, is, is such an honor and privilege, but getting to share that with Max um, was just, yeah. Um, what dreams are made of, really. Yeah, well, there's only a few brothers who have ever done it as well. You know, you look at the Vonopolas, you, you talk about the Underwoods, you know, those legends. And I think the Evans, they come into that, into that bracket as well. Ah, no, I mean, it, sadly, it was, yeah, it was, it was short-lived. But um, Well, that's what I was going to ask you about next as well, Tommy, is obviously being a professional, special contact sport, you, you get injuries, sadly, and you pick up some bad injuries. I've had, you know, shoulder, shoulder injuries, ankle re surgery on, on the ligaments. I've had ACL construction on my knee, but yeah. you sadly, during an international game as well with Scotland, uh, suffered a very bad neck injury. Um, just tell me what it's like, you know, sort of to have your sort of dreams halted. Also, the, the care that you got and, and what happens to you, you know, post all that, you know, someone telling you, sitting you down and saying, you know, rugby is no longer an option for you. Oh, like really tough Ben um you know I've, I've I've spoken about it a while but you know every time I I kind of speak about it and relive it it it, it, it was such a a turning point in my life because like in anything if, you, if you've worked your whole life to get somewhere and sadly it's suddenly taken um it, it's a tough pill to swallow and for me you know rugby since I was 15 as I said it, it's all I wanted to do um, I trained, I sacrificed, you know, going away on, on lads holidays um, because, you know, my dream was to play international rugby and that's, that's what you do. Um, and I was 24, you know, I, I just about sort of established myself uh, in the Scotland setup, um, cemented my position on the wing and, you know, playing against Wales. And it was a weird day because for me, we had our best team going into that game and, you know, Scotland's a small nation and has a small pool of players. So when there's injuries, you know, the team suffers. And that day we seemed to have our, our best 22 on paper. So I was, there was this huge sort of feeling of excitement going into that game and, and what we were going to, you know, lay down. And we came out the blocks firing. We were like all over Wales and, they, they didn't really have an answer to what was going on. And um, then we started Chris Patterson, who was earning his like 100th 100th cap that, that day, had a terrible kidney injury. Um, so he went down, then, then I went down, and then Rory Lamont sort of injured, ruptured his knee. Um, and it was just, it, it was so disappointing because I just, I just would have loved to have seen what that 22 could have achieved that day, had the injuries um not happened and then for me uh personally it was yeah just a, a really bad day at the office i just um sustained that neck injury and um was so so grateful of the attention that i received on the field with with the likes of dr james robson who you know earned his 250th game in duty the other day for scotland which is an unbelievable achievement but a testament to the man who yeah got there on the field um, at the most crucial time, made sure I was handled 
with the utmost care and thanks to him really the outcome of my injury um was as successful as it was but it was so tough to to lie in hospital and even though I'd made the recovery I'd made and I was appreciative of that to know I was never going to play again was really 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 hard to swallow yeah I think you can tell the way you talk about it what yeah. what I love though Tommy is straight away you were like oh I wish we could have played that game again with us all fit and see how we go. I love that mentality. I love that. I, you know, listen, you know, I've met a lot of rugby guys throughout my whole career and, you know, you are someone that's always stuck in my head. as just a really good guy. You always approach everything. You have a professional attitude. You, you take everything full on, uh, head down, straight through it. And when you, when you're throwing a cur curveball, you adapt. And I love that about you. It's, it's one of your best qualities, mate. You always, and you always have a smile on your face as well. <laughs> the smiles on yeah. so unless, I, unless I'm forgetting my lines on uh, on the stage at X Factor. Which... <laughs> unless we're in, yeah, unless it's thirty seconds till we're on stage and we're all you saw the ghost. You saw the ghost <laughs> come <laughs> out in me. So you mentioned before, obviously you're in the bright lights of uh, LA and Hollywood. Um, have you managed to catch any of the start of the MLR season now that the the league is back underway after a twelve month hiatus? Did you uh, manage to see any of the games? I have, yeah. I um, it, it's it's really like uh, again, like a, a blessing that LA have you know just um, launched their team, the, the Guiltinis. Uh, you know, at such an incredible um, stadium, the you know the Los Angeles Memorial Stadium. It looks unreal, especially to be to be playing rugby when I compare it to you know the grounds I used to play on back in back in Scotland and, and growing up in England. Um, but for me personally, it's it's great because I know a couple of the lads in the team. DT van der Merwe, I played with at the, at the Glasgow Warriors, great player, and a young lad called Adam Ash, who I never played with, but number eight, and only heard great things about him. And so to have that like on my doorstep, um, I was gutted I couldn't actually watch it this weekend. But they're not allowing yeah. uh, home fans, obviously, with the COVID situation. I think until April twenty third. But managed to catch the games on um, the MLR uh, Rugby Network, and uh, was was really impressed actually with the standard of of play. You know, I I love the fact that it's 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 free flowing rugby. You know, I think I think the weather helps that, um, and I love that it's it's quite evenly contested. You know, everyone's everyone's up for playing rugby. Everyone's up for chucking the ball around, and you know, being a fullback and, and a winger you know, ourselves, Ben, like, that's the rugby you want to play, you know, not this, just truck it up, you know, wet conditions, not being able to move, like freezing on the wing. And, and it was just really good to see the quality and the, the eagerness to play uh, in, in, in watching the ML, MLR league this weekend. Yeah, I think that most, yeah, I think you're definitely right in the way that they're approaching the game. They want to play top of the ground rugby, free-flowing, it's funny you talk about the weather because in New York, obviously, I'm still involved with Rooney, but um, we don't play a home game until after sort of March because then it starts getting warmer here. So we always go to the, you know, go to the south. We go to like, no, we've got Nolan again. We obviously went off to, to Vegas and played San Diego in our opening game. So, yeah, I completely agree with you. It's one of the things that coached me over as well is that, you know, I fed up with playing in Newcastle on a Friday night in, yeah. the, in the sleet and the rain. It's nothing more miserable than that. And, and 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 like you said, you know, like with with the signings of big names, especially with the, you know, the, the Giltinis and uh, Billy Meeks, Adam Ashley Cooper, Matt Gifford. Adam Ashley Cooper, yeah, Billy Meeks, yeah, it's like big signings, and you know, that's hopefully only going to follow. And 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 the more big names that start coming over to the league, um, it, it is is only going to be a great thing uh, for American rugby. And I, I honestly don't think there's there's any doubt in my mind that it in a couple of years time it can be a real league to be reckoned with because who wouldn't want to play free-flowing rugby you know especially like out here in Los Angeles in a stadium like the Memorial Stadium I mean, I mean I kind of want to come out of retirement myself <laughs> um, dust off the cobwebs and 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 give it a go my you know because it just looks beautiful it, it certainly does and and speaking of coming out of retirement uh, I know I, well, you've, you've sort of wrote me into maybe uh, making an appearance at the Dubai Sevens with a, with a 
with a couple of uh, old faces and old acquaintances of ours over the years. Ben Gollings, a seventh player, Slossie Pack and Fucking Bow, Dallin Armitage. I mean, it's a mean team that they put together. When was the last time you played rugby, Tommy? So the last time I actually played was in Dubai. Um, I played for the UR, UR, URL Sevens team. Um, and that was five years after I'd had my um, injury to my neck. I was kind of categorically told I should never play again. But, you know, having made the recovery uh, that I had and not, not always in my lifetime wanting to accept like no as an answer, I decided to go out there and play. And I was so grateful that I did. You know, the team I was involved with had the likes of Matt Tar Turner, who's obviously at this, the uh, Seattle Seahawks and great player, played England sevens in his time, but was involved with a really good bunch of boys and we ended up winning. And uh, just to be back, you know, involved in a rugby team and have that camaraderie, have that like purpose, you know, like to be doing your part for the team and just involved involved in the changing room banter. Like it's it's what you kind of take for granted when you play, but the moment you stop, you really appreciate, you know, how good how good that is because it it doesn't really happen in any other walks of life that that camaraderie you get, you know, in, in rugby. And um yes, I miss the playing side, but it's it's that I miss the most. So if you could obviously um, speak to a, a younger Tom Evans, would you, would you give him the advice to maybe go over to America and play in the MLR? Because usually with the MLR or with American rugby, you know, I've played with a few American guys, like Sam Manoa who played for Northampton, but obviously for them to get the good, good rugby background, they, they normally travel out of America and go to Europe, play in the Premiership or in the Magnus yep. or play in the French leagues. Whereas now there's a professional league, it seems that a few foreigners are actually doing the opposite and coming over. Like we said, Matt Gitto, Astro was here last year, Mar Nonno was another guy. Would a younger Tom Evans be interested in maybe going out to the LL Giltinis or, or the Seattle Seahawks or maybe the Rooney Roosters? It's, it's a tough one because, you know, uh, like a, young, a, a younger me would always want to be where the best rugby is. And, you know, right now, the most competitive, the best rugby is sort of in Europe. It's in Southern Hemisphere. Um, and so I, I would probably still, still stick there. But having said that, if I was like an academy lad coming through Wasps, I would definitely tell a younger me to at least give it a try for like a year or so. Because, you know, the, the standard of rugby is still very high. And... If you're playing week in, week out, why not be over here playing week in, week out in glorious weather with free-flowing rugby? You know, really learning the trade, really learning, like, off X, like, legends um, who have been there, done it. Um, so in answer to your question, yes, if I, was, if I was young and coming through the academy, I would definitely seri seriously consider taking a year out and going and playing in the, in the NLR. Interestingly, you say that because I think, um, you know, the season's actually quite short. We only play usually, obviously it's a bit different this year with COVID, but the season runs from end of January to sort of June. So it's quite a short window of the season. Yeah. And interestingly, I've always thought that what would help some of these teams is linking themselves with another professional setup. Because you know how it is when you're in the academy at Wasps or you're in the academy at Glasgow, Northampton, the squad is sort of around 38, 39 players. And I think that, that point of your career, when you're 18, 19 years old, and you're making that transition from boys' rugby to men's rugby, is very, very important. And, you know, yeah, there is the championship where you can go and play for, for the likes of Coventry or, or play for the Ealing or whatever like that. But I, I always love the... You know, they've done it with a few players. Well, Joe, Joe March and was sent off to the Southern Hemisphere to go and, and play a little bit before yeah. he took wins. And I think it would be a great sort of learning step for, for young players in Europe to come over here and play top of the ground rugby in the MLR. I think it'd be great for them. I think it'd be great for the game over here because we'll get exciting talent. They'll put more emphasis on young players coming through and, and joining, you know, the exciting league, but then going back to England and maybe playing for their, for their countries or Scotland. And then, obviously, 
it, it helps to promote the world uh, the world of rugby in terms of like the international stage. So yeah, I 100% agree with you, Tommy, on that. I think, that, I, I think Ben, you were spot on with that last point you made, you know, giving these like young superstars a chance to come over and play, you know, is only going to, you know, make, make the young superstars of American rugby stand up and, and, and really want to get involved because, you know, you only have to look at the, the sevens, the USA sevens team and the likes of Carl and Isles and all these guys, you know, and, and the speed and the athleticism which these guys possess, you know, it, it's frightening. They've, they've got so much talent. And if they're seeing you know, youngsters their age coming over and, 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 and doing their bit, you know, in the league, what's to say that, that they're not going to want to get involved, you know, even more so. And like I said, with the big, bigger names now signing um, in the league, it's, it's, it's only going to hopefully um, become more and more. And it's, it's exciting because, I think I was really, you know, I'm not going to lie. I'd, I'd never seen the league, the MLR league, uh, until this weekend, and I was really impressed with the standard and the the, the mindset of of the attacking rugby that that I saw. Yeah, the MLR is growing. You know, I've been involved here now for three years. It's getting bigger and bigger every year. More money, more traction, more popularity, and obviously it's about growing homegrown rugby players. Americans love to support American talent. And I think the big thing for this sport to sort of take off is to find, you know, you have your Dan Carters of New Zealand, you have your Johnny Wilkinson of, of yeah. England, you have your Chris Patterson, who's a hundred capper for Scotland. Yeah. They're looking for that next guy, you know, the, the, the 23, 24 year old, you know, the looks of Tom Evans, the, uh, the athleticism of Ben Foden. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and obviously once they can nail that, you know, the sky's the limit. I think once people, like you said, young kids can look up to these guys and realize there's a career path and becoming a professional. And one thing as well in America is education. And yeah. with, with college over here as well, college rugby is starting to be a real thing and you can actually earn an education through playing rugby as well, which is very exciting. As mentioned, Tommy, you are out in LA um, living the high life um, with your significant other half, or your better half, I should say. Um, and she will be our next guest joining you to talk about all things sport-related, rugby-related, American-related. So our next guest will be Nicole Scherzinger. Hello, Nicole, and thank you very much for joining us on the USA Rugby Clubhouse. It is a pleasure to have you on. What a beautiful couple you are. <laughs> it's so great. good to see you, Ben. You look great, buddy. Come on, TriStar. Come on, TriStar. So, Nicole, I'm going to start with the basics. Obviously, you are very sporty. We've seen in your TikTok videos, your Instagram videos, you're always in the gym. Tom's usually joining you, doing dancing. Uh, and obviously, you have a big, big dancing background with the Pussycat Dolls. But I want to know your sporting background. When you were a kid growing up, what kind of sports did you do? Or was it straight theatre and dancing, and that's why you kept in shape? My sister was the more athletic one. Tommy can attest to that. <laughs> um, I dabbled in softball. Do y'all have that in England? Softball, we do. Yeah, not, it's not as big in England as it is in, in America, but I know it's quite a big thing in American schools. But rounders, don't we? Rounders. I used to love a game of rounders, Tommy. You should okay. love a game of rounders. My nickname was uh, Noodle Arm. So, yeah, we won't talk about how good I was in sports um, from now on. And then I, I played a little bit of basketball only because my dad loved basketball. So I loved like sitting on the couch and watching basketball with him. Um, but yeah, that was about it. I was really more into singing. I discovered Whitney Houston at a very young age. So I was like just obsessed with like singing and making up dances in my backyard. Well, it's interesting you say that because Tom and I have complete opposites, really. We were. We, 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 we loved a little bit of Whitney and a little bit of Westlife and those sort of people. And then Joan Lomu came on the scene and Johnny Wilkinson and that sort of took our fancy and we went down the other route. But I think you're a testament to it that, you know, we were nearly there. We nearly made it. You know what, Ben? I, I didn't know Westlife. And then you played me. What's that song? It's like my favorite song now. Um, Flying Without Wings. Flying Without Wings and oh. um, Hello, My Love from their new album. Hello, my love. Yeah, far, flying without wings is like an anthem, though, yeah, over, yeah. over in Europe. I'm now obsessed with Westlife, so. <laughs> Thanks to Tom. Yeah. To Tom. And, and, and talking about Tom's influence on you, obviously, Tom is a, an ex-professional rugby player. Has he taught you anything about rugby? Have you been, 
you know, pulled into the world of rugby just yet? Or has you, have you managed to keep it at, at arm's length? Yeah, not just yet. Um, I, I have learned a little bit. Um, I'm hoping to, to take her down to the Giltinis. I think that's, Nate, yeah, definitely. That's the important thing. I think you, like, you experience rugby, you've got to go to a live game. Yeah, talk through the, the rules. A live game. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited. I think we're going to go in April, yeah. right, to see a live game. But he, I, I've learned a little bit. I just always thought, you know, Americans are always like, oh, my gosh, rugby's so gnarly. But I have so much respect. Uh, you know, I think now watching a little bit with him and seeing it through his eyes, I'm like, wow, this is like, it's hardcore. It's amazing. Um, well, rugby is actually the fastest growing sport in America and for women. Um, so oh, the seventh wow. game is in the Olympics now as well. So there's a big push on that. But the Olympics 15 side of game is, is getting bigger in college and in grassroots levels. So I think the question is, Nicole, if you had to put yourself on the rugby field, which position do you think you would play? Would you be, you know, a speedster on the outside or would you like the, the rough and tough of being in the forwards or you're a little bit nippy playing scrum half? I think I'd be a, like a... I wouldn't be as fast as him, but it a wing <laughs> that it yeah, speeds from the outside. So I'd be running away from everyone yeah. so I couldn't get I, I had you down as a winger, Nicole. I think you're <laughs> just you just, you've got the showbiz, the X factor we call it. I'd yeah. be like, get me out of here. <laughs> I... Yeah. So where, another thing as well is obviously there's teams popping up all over the MLR. Now there's 12 in total. There's supposed to be 13, but sadly Dallas had to pull out because of the COVID. Um but of of the all the teams involved, I'm not sure if you know them all, Nicole. But where, which, who would be your team to follow? I know you live in LA, but you didn't grow up in LA, did you? No, I think the team that I would follow, and the probably the one team I know of more than any of them is the All Blacks, in New Zealand. But right. that's because of my Hawaiian background. So I think obviously I would support my Polynesian people. But I think that some of the ex um, rugby um, all Blacks are maybe trying to get um, a rugby team together in Hawaii. So that would be really awesome. That is absolutely right. Yeah, there was a, a lot of noise about them uh, putting together a team. Uh, I'm not sure it sort of fell through in the last minute, but again, hopefully there's, there's rumors of Chicago having a new team. Obviously, you know, Hawaii, uh, Dallas are coming in next year. So there's always all these teams popping up. There's 12 teams in total at the moment. I'm not sure if you're aware, Nicole, but Tom said that he managed to watch the LL Giltini's game at the weekend uh, and said that he's going to try and get you down to a game. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think you, you'll be, be following the LA, LA, LA team? Oh, yeah. I can't wait. Uh, he was like, would you want to go? And I was like, I would have missed it for the world. So Especially when I showed her the stadium. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful stadium. Right. It's a tough name to pronounce, isn't it? The G -G 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 yeah. but he owns the Giltini. Oh, tongue twister, isn't it? But LA, LA Giltinis and Austin Gilgronis are the two teams he owns. Um, it's a guy called uh, Gilchrist, who's the F45, the, the founder of F45, Jim's Nicole. So Australian guy, he's, he's a bit out there, but he's making big moves, brought in some big names to LA to sort of match the, the likes of the Lakers and the Dodgers. He knows that he's got to compete at a, a big level. So um, it's interesting to see what he's doing there. I think he's doing big things. So hopefully you'll have a good team to follow. I think it'll be an exciting team to watch as well. They play a good brand of rugby. So if they're gonna, if they're gonna make a fan, I think they'll make a fan out of you guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to see my first rugby game. Yeah. I mean, through his eyes, having him there will, mm. you know, otherwise I'd be like, what is happening? Yeah, get a coach <laughs> through it. Some of the rules. And Nicole, you've been to you've you've sung at a few events and things like that as well. They're big on having the national anthem or having a halftime act and things like that. Obviously, the Super Bowl with the halftime act. What do you think MLR? Well, what do you think rugby in general needs to sort of break through and transcend into the into the American audience? Oh gosh, I don't know. I think um, I think it, we just need to be educated on it. You know, we just simply we're such a big. We're so into our American football here. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I think the beauty of all sports is that it, you know, it, it, it brings people together. It raises spirits. Um, it's a true testament of what discipline um, uh, and dedication and hard work will, will get mm -hmm. you. So 
I think just um, engaging more people, great players, but I mean, you guys are, it's such an amazing sport. It speaks for itself. It's got everything. It's like hardcore. I mean, it's got so much heart and, and, mm -hmm. and hard work and dedication. So I think that speaks for itself. And it's just more about educating the people, getting the players and bringing people together. I think it's obviously a, a hard time with COVID and everything, but the world is, is starting to open mm -hmm. back up and we're definitely going to support and be there. And I know how much it means to Tommy. So that's why I'm going to be there with, I don't know, like the flags or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. The bears, Nicole, holding the bears. It's all you yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> and Tommy mentioned that he might, uh, you know, fancy dusting off the boots and, and playing again. But as, as now a, uh, uh, a couple, would that worry you watching him go over the field, looking at the big hits and the, the, the impact of the sport? Obviously, like, I believe in him, and I think, you know, with his injury in the past, that's a bit of a worry, but I know that, like, if he decided to commit and do it, I'm also very competitive, so I'd be like, if you're not first, you're last, get on out there, Tommy, so... <laughs> We mentioned how competitive you both are, so we thought it was only right that we create our own game to see who would be victorious at being the biggest gnaws between Tom and Nicole. So we've created the game Singer or Winger. We have a quick rugby focused quiz for you both, and we want to see who knows more about both of your professions. As well, as we all know, Nicole, you're famous for being a singer, and Tom, you're famous for being an international rugby player and winger. So we're going to pit you against each other to see who has the best knowledge. So Nicole, you have to be quiet while I ask Tom this first question, because you might know the answer. And Tom, you have to do the same when I ask Nicole. So question number one to you, Tom. Is Blake Shelton an international winger or international singer? Yeah. It's Blake Shelton. Like, are seriously? We just, are, we, are we just warming up here or what? Wow. That's not even there. hard, Ben. It's going to get harder. It's going to get harder. Relax, relax, relax. Okay. Is there a real game? <laughs> okay. Question number one to you, Nicole. Ringo Sheena. Singer or a winger? A winger. That is incorrect, I'm afraid. Yes! Yes! Ringo Sheena is a singer, a Japanese singer-songwriter, writer, famous for J-pop. I knew that. Is this really what's happening? You're going to say one of the biggest country stars ever, Blake Shelton, and then I get some random <laughs> pop one. Okay. pop act. Okay. Okay. Tom, wow. it's one two. It's one nil at the moment, Nicole. Just remember, though, Nicole, Tom's my boy. I've known him since I should have gotten Ringo Settle Star down. instead. Down. Ringo Settle Star. Down. Settle down. <laughs> I can see this is going to go one way. <laughs> competitive oh, nature. You didn't even know that, who that was. Okay. It, 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 that's it's random. gone. Let it go. It's just... Okay, Tom, next one for you. Spike Davis, is it a winger or a singer? I'm going to have to push you here, Tommy. Singer. Sorry? Singer. That is... Incorrect. He is a yeah, winner I knew it. I knew it. and played for the USA in 2007 American Championship. So, oh, Tommy, we need to get you invested in more of the MLR, mate. You need to watch some more rugby at the weekend. Look oh. <laughs> happy Nicole is. <laughs> okay, time to even the score, Nicole, hopefully. Shane Williams, singer or winger? Winger. Final answer. <laughs> Stick with your answer, Nicole. Stick with your okay, answer. Okay, I'm going to go with the winger. You are correct. Shane Williams is an international, one of the biggest international wings to come out of Wales. A brilliant player. Um, uh, isn't Shane one of the uh, biggest international uh, wingers to come out of Wales? Who? <laughs> Isn't Shane one of the biggest international wingers to come out of Wales? He is, Nicole. Your knowledge, outstanding, yeah, it's outstanding knowledge of rugby. I, I thought I remembered that, Shane Williams. Wales. Yeah. That's yeah. right. That's well, because my friend Julie McDonald's is, is from Wales. So I was like, oh my God, Shane, one of the biggest international wingers yeah. to come uh, out of Wales as well. My turn. My turn. Obviously. 
and and Nicole. Help me out with that, Alex, in the edit. Nicole knew of Spike Davis because she's American and she follows the MLR rugby, so she knew yeah. that he plays Tom, your 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 knowledge on country music is is top notch, but it turns out that your rugby rugby knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's one all, one all. Next one, Tom. Yeah, Matt Terry. Singer. He was a singer. Nicole knows the right. easiest one. I only know that because she mentored him. Yes, that is co co yeah, correct. In 2016. Oh, good job. Look at that. Nicole, he was stalking you before you became a couple. <laughs> we all know that. Happy to be with the only male. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well done. Well done, Tom. Okay. Nicole. Lauren Doyle. Winger or singer? Look, look how much it means to her. Is there a time thing going on this call? <laughs> I'm gonna say it sounded at first like a singer because I think there's some singers with that name, but I'm gonna say a winger. She is a winger. She is a winger for the American Sevens team. Wait a second, isn't Lauren Doyle a winger for the American Sevens team? <laughs> That is correct, Nicole. Unbelievable. Your knowledge is just is out, outstands me. Okay. Two all. Two all. How do you know these things? How do you know? I, I love the fact that Nicole knows showbiz and she's like, oh, we can cut this. <laughs> Guess who I learned that from? <laughs> Simon Powell. Every time I would say something, he'd repeat it. And I was like, why are you repeating everything after me? As I said it first, and he would say, not in the edit, darling. And I'd be like. <laughs> oh, nice. A, a, a wonderful. <clears throat> right, OK, where are we at? What was, what's the score? Two all. All tied. All to play for. What's it up to? to? It goes up to one, two, five. Yeah, there's five questions. You've answered oh, three, so you've got two left each. Okay. OK. OK. It is on to Tom. Tom, question number three. Three or four? Four. Question number four for you, Tom. Cameron Dolan, winger or singer? Winger. That is, well, actually both. We, he was he's the he was the first guest on before you guys. He's a, a player for uh, Nola Gold, but he also sings a, a, a bit of country himself. He had a cowboy hat on and he gave us a little rendition. Oh, um, nice. uh, he's a winger, yes, he plays for uh, Nola Gold and obviously was a teammate of mine at Northampton, Tommy. I don't know if you knew that when he came over and played a bit in, in uh, Northampton. So well done. Three, two, all to play for. Nicole. Cameron, Cameron sings a little bit of country, right? <laughs> she's on fire today. <laughs> yeah. She's got it nailed down. She's, yeah, this is, she knows the ins and the outs, mate. It's called what it is. Okay, Nicole, your fourth question. Carl Douglas, singer or winger? I mean, that sounds like a winger. Final answer. <laughs> Do you know, Tom? Do you know? I know. Okay, then a winger? <laughs> Tom, do you know who it is? No. <laughs> he's a singer and he's famous for singing the song Kung Fu Fighting. Never would have got that. Oh, shoot. No, what? Everybody was Kung Fu Fighting. That one? Ah, yeah. <laughs> Fast as lightning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one. So, who knew? There you go. A bit of information for you. Carl Douglas, Kung Fu Fighting. So, 3-2, Nicole, you're trailing late in the game. Tom, you can finish it with this last one. Okay, hit me. So, fifth question for Tom. Luke Hume, singer or winger? My, my initial gut was winger. But something just tells me singer, so I'm going to go singer. 
That is not correct, Tommy. No, you should no. have gone. Luke Hugh so is, is a teammate of mine at Rooney. At Rooney Bruce. He didn't play at the weekend because uh, sadly the COVID, COVID struck. Um, but he felt like a winger. Well, he's a teammate of yours, right? He is, Nicole. How do you know these things? It felt like a winger. It felt like it to my core. And I just, I just, I denied my natural impulse. I'm angry. No, and I think it's going to cost you, Tommy, because, you know, I, I'm, I, I know Nicole's in-depth knowledge of rugby, and I just feel this one's a, a no-brainer at the end. So to tie things up, Nicole, your fifth and final question of singer-winger, Jonah Lomu. Singer or winger? Oh, I know this one. Wait, what's the name? I know this one. What is it? What's the name? Loma, Loma. Loma. Oh, oh, that's going to get you confused because it sounds like a rugby player as well. <laughs> I like what you guys did there. We need to play some like music over the top of this now as well. Like, doo -doo -doo -doo. okay, I'm going to say a winger. You are correct, Nicole. Yes! <laughs> I was trying to throw all in the world. Yeah. See Everybody the was kung fu fighting. Yeah. Okay. I know that you two can't live with each other having, you know, a draw. So we need to have a winner. So we've got a bonus question. Is it just whoever guesses it first? Whoever guesses it first. Whoever's yeah, whoever whoever shouts out the first one, you know, they'll be the winner. Okay. So. <laughs> do 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 do. Ben Foden, singer or winger? Winger. I'm a singer, dude. I don't play on the yeah. wing. I'm a fullback. Singer! Yes, Nicole, singer. we have a winner. We have a winner. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I feel like Nicole my- wins, Tom. I got I don't a play so I am sorry. a fullback. I am a fullback, Tom. I am not a winger. I am a fullback. So I actually feel I am a singer. So Nicole, you win. You are win. the biggest rugby and singing Norse this side of the West Coast. Okay, I see, I see how this is. Internationally, you did that, right? Yeah, exactly. See? Okay. I uh, know that. We all know the real, the viewers will know the real winner, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, guys, for joining me. I've had a great time speaking to you both. You are always a ray of sunlight. Uh, you've got smiles <laughs> on your faces. Uh, always a pleasure to, to see you on screen, and thank you very much for spending some time with me in my rugby clubhouse. Guys, thank you so much for having us, Ben. It is a pleasure as always to see you. Thanks to Alex and the team for having us on this show. We've loved it and uh, hope to see you soon. So with all this in mind, we've had an awesome first show. We've had an amazing first weekend of Major League Rugby. Finally, after a year hiatus, we're back in business. We're really excited to share all things American rugby with you over the coming months ahead. But until that time, we'll see you in the USA Rugby Clubhouse. We sure will. Take care, guys. See you next week.